I don't care what nobody says. Military is still prejudice. They still have their little thing. You know, you down there in white folks' country, you know, you got them southerners and, you know, we call you boy and everything. You can call me shithead, dickhead, maggot and everything, but boy, boy play with Tarzan. I'm a soldier. I'm a warrior. Boy. Tell me you see a boy spit on him. Tarzan, you see a boy spit on him. I had to beat the shit out of him. You know, we getting the martial arts from, from, from the war. Um, you know, I did Vietnam right out of high school. And uh, they were drafting people all over the place for army and everything else like that. And I went there really for education. The streets was eating people up a lot. Um, I don't really know a lot of my friends, personal friends that I grew up with, who didn't go to jail or they dead or so it got out. So you had to find a kind of a way out. You may be a musician and they may say to you, well you join the service and you get to play your instrument. You like the box, you join the service, you get a chance to box. Yeah, he went to the service and took up boxing and then became uh, the champion in his weight division. And at that time, well, let me tell you anything. And I believed it because I was young, 18 years old. And I signed up. But a lot of people don't realize, you know, back in the 60s when they were drafting people for that Vietnam War, the average person that went in that war was a kid. 16 or 18 years old were at war. Let me say this to you in all sincerity, Mr. X. War is old people talking and young people dying. You know, maybe that's the reason why we get had the reputation of Vietnam veterans of being crazy and... So they had a lot of problems at that time. A lot of the, mili the, mili lot of the military men came from, from the war and so on. So they, they were crazy. Oh, what are you killers? They were crazy. What makes the grass grow? Blood. They'll shoot you, whatever. Oh, one shot, one kill. Ain't no playing. They were crazy. Charlie taught me that. You know who Charlie is? My American heroes. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. That's how they were. And so these GIs came back with that kind of attitude, take down and terminate. That made them more than just warriors. It made some of them monsters because of what they went through over there. Going in the Marine Corps in 1968 at the height of the Tet Offensive <laughs> and coming back here in one piece with a mind relatively intact. They had a lot of guys there that um, was in the service, Korean War and stuff like that, and brought stuff back from Japan. Yeah, he landed in Japan. So when he came home, he like he always had to, because he would he would only do it when he get drunk, because he was shell shocked. Now that that just made it even that enhanced their ability 
to kill somebody, let's put it that way. But basically for me, I think that they went over there with the knowledge. Let's start with the Vietnam War. What was that, 70, 71, 72? Before that, we're talking about the 60s, we're talking about the 50s. That's when we had Moses Powell, George Cofield, the puppet, Earl Bennett, you know, and so on and so on. So these brothers that went over there, they were warriors before they went over there. Warriors make soldiers. Always wanted to be that, as far as I can remember. I've always wanted to be that. It kind of like really wasn't too much of a difference, you know what I mean? That being prepared, not just walking around thinking everything is okay. You couldn't do that in the military. So I came in like that, you know, because I came from the streets that you'd look around the corner and not trust everything. What was that? You know, <laughs> that type of stuff. So it, it sort of prepared me for that. I was not afforded the opportunity to go to leadership school in there. But because of my background, it afforded me an opportunity to take charge. In other words, I'm really trying to say that I don't think it was really the other way around that, that the war hardened me for the streets. I think it was really the other way around. I was already hard and I went to the war. He was in, he was in the military in Okinawa. He was in the career. He, I don't know his, his other name, but he was, he was one of them Vietnam vets, that's for sure. His father is in the Marine Corps Hall of Fame. Um, they call him Judo Jones. He taught combat martial arts in the Marine Corps. I was from one of uh, my neighbors. He was a uh, World War II uh, veteran and uh, to take me up on the roof and show me some of the things that they truly learned in the military. So when they brought it back to the urban environment, it changed a whole lot of the ways that we did things. When they came back, they taught us something about survival that we didn't see here in the streets. So my first introduction was on the combat level. I suppose Pereira, he was a sniper. So wherever he went, wherever he went for his training, he picked up something and he was in service or brought back. And rightfully so, uh, especially back in our days because we, we fought most of the Southeast Asia wars there, Vietnam, Korea, uh, you know, with the East, where a lot of the arts are. So, it made sense for us to come back. Those GIs brought stuff back, our eyes were wide open, like what? So he showed me basic little things that I could comprehend at eight years old. So I, I digress by saying that the military aspect of it was GIs were coming back, combat ready to the streets that they were walking in. So me, for them, when they were learning, they were learning hand-to-hand -hand combat, certain things like that. So what happened when they bring you to back to a lot of the brothers, they give you what they could only give you, like my uncle did. They referred to it as combat martial arts. It was implemented with the weapon trainings that they received. Well, you know, I, the way I see that is that a lot of that was really combat martial art. So where they knew to shoot at or use a bayonet at, and studying the human anatomy and knowing where the pressure points are, they then utilize that as what they refer to as quick kills when implementing the hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, the spirit of hand-to-hand -hand combat is to kill. You know, it wasn't tournament stuff. It never was designed that. It was designed to uh, take down and, and terminate. They go in there, I see them in the tournaments, man, and they punching, you know what I'm saying? Hey, ah! Holding your hand up. That's when you need to cut somebody's head up on the battlefield and you're holding it up. They don't even know where that comes from. But what little did they learn, they were teaching family members. And those family members were saying, hey, well, my cousin is teaching whatever, come on. I mean, he was my uncle, my uncle had came home from the, um, the Japanese conflict war. Well, my father, Reverend James Crossan, who was at the time a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor in the military, of course, my brother Milo was a, a boxer in the service. No one in my family ever bothered him, especially when he came back from Vietnam. Anything would go wrong, they would call him. Yes, yeah, so I think if you did the history on a lot of them, you would find a lot of them don't brag about it because it's war. You know, very few people really in war brag about war.
I'm sure there was a lot of other black soldiers that brought home knowledge and information not only in the martial arts but just various things that they've learned about survival. They brought that home and taught that to their kids and taught it to the black families in generally which helped us to survive. Taught me how to wash, iron, sew, cook, clean, humility, and showed me how to defend myself. <laughs> And then for my father to be an instructor in the army, to teach hand-to-hand -hand combat at that time, there was a lot of racism going on. I didn't understand all that back then. I don't care what nobody says. Military is still prejudice. They still have their little thing. Um, for people to say that racism did not exist inside the military, or if they say to this day it doesn't do that, they've never been in the military. He said in the military, it was very hard. They try to kill you there. You gotta remember when you're in the military, everybody got a gun. <laughs> okay, I just put it, I just put it that way. Movies, some of the movies, they make it. Glamorous. Like I say, it's not a bad little war. Everybody want to be in there and be superheroes. You know, then the people coming home, they begin to tell you the stories of war. You hear the cries and the moans and the groans. seeing people and they tell you all y'all ain't coming back home. Told you everybody ain't coming home. You gotta wanna come home. Real talk. It's just that simple.